high time, well past time, in fact, that Australia has to give up on this fiction that we are going to be dealing with a country that's sort of democratizing. And we have to understand um, China for what it is, which is a Leninist one party state with a very strong um, concept of they win, we lose as being the model of how they want to approach diplomacy. To get Brexit. Uh, make America great again. No, no, no. This is Stephen Edgington for The Sun, and today I'm interviewing Peter Jennings. Peter Jennings is an Australian foreign policy expert. He's worked for the government on and off for over 20 years in Australia, advising prime ministers. He was chief of staff to the Minister for Defence. And we're going to be talking all about Australia's relationship with China. China has been imposing tariffs and threatening other measures to punish Australia for calling for an inquiry into the origins of coronavirus. We're going to be talking all about China and Australia's relationship over the last 10, 20 years and the Cold War between the West and China that is now emerging. Our Burning Questions series runs every single week, so click on the link in the description below to watch all of our interviews, and I hope you enjoy this one. Uh, can you explain to viewers why China is currently imposing tariffs on Australia? Well, there's uh, a fake reason and a real reason. Uh, the fake reason is the reason that China is giving, which is that um, there has been uh, dumping of Australian barley products onto the Chinese market at unfair low prices. Uh, and uh, the Chinese trade officials have assembled a, a raft of um, factors which they say point to dumping, including things like, for example, drought relief payments to farmers on the east coast of Australia, where, where in fact 80% of the barley that we export to China comes from South Australia and the West Coast. Uh, it, it's, in other words, pretty confected. Um, I think the real reason is a political reason, Stephen, and, and that's because um, at about the time China raised uh, Bali as, as a trade question uh, was pretty much the same time uh, back in late 19, uh, back in late 2018, that our government took the decision uh, effectively to ban high-risk Chinese companies from the 5G network. Um, and, you know, we've long had the experience of, I guess, sort of threatened uh, trade and economic retaliation to political decisions that Canberra makes that, that China doesn't like. Then I think it, it just so happened that uh, the next um, sort of, well, an, another source of annoyance to China was that um, our Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, uh, proposed um, a few weeks ago now that uh, there should be an independent inquiry into the origins of the coronavirus um, outbreak in, in Wuhan. And that has significantly annoyed the, the Chinese. So um, put all those things together and I think what we had was um, a shot across the bows, um, a warning to Australia to say, look, either you play according to the rules as we want them um, or else we will do you economic damage. Um, and there's no doubt that this could do damage. The, the value of the barley exports um, at the moment is about 600 million Australian dollars. Um, and, you know, it, it'll be no no small thing for those farmers to find um, alternative markets. And it's not just barley. I mean, they're, they're threatening to impose tariffs on various goods and other punitive measures. Uh, the Chinese ambassador is sort of talking about Australian tourism or, or tourism into Australia rather from, from Chinese people. Uh, being reduced. Um, and this is all very recently. And I want to really focus in on the last point that you made there as to why they're doing this, in that Scott Morrison has called for an independent inquiry into the origins of coronavirus. Um, do you think that the actions of the Chinese are the actions of a state that has nothing to hide? Absolutely not, Stephen. No, on, on the contrary, I think we've seen a really unedifying scramble on the part of the Communist Party from as early as December to effectively initially deny that there was a problem, um, then to cover it up. Uh, then we had a phase in January where uh, certainly in Australia, I'm, I'm not sure about the UK, but in Australia, we had this sort of panic buying of uh, medical equipment, personal protective gear by Chinese companies based in Australia that were being flown to Wuhan on chartered aircraft. 
pretty much at the same time as the Chinese foreign minister was saying to our foreign minister, look, this is an easily treatable, controllable disease. There's nothing to worry about. Um, so, you know, I think what, what has happened here is that the Communist Party desperately wants to avoid um, a genuinely open um, investigation into the origins of the virus because to do so will expose the party for, um, you know, a number of serious failings both domestically and uh, internationally. Um, and that was the position they, they have been... Um, well, the, 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 they've been arguing with Australia to uh, not allow that to the, the investigation to take place on the basis that it was somehow political, whereas I don't think that was ever really our government's intention. I think they genuinely wanted to understand the origins of the virus because that would actually help in working out appropriate treatment strategies. Uh, you know, the Chinese have still not actually handed over samples, original samples of the virus from the early days of infections. They've provided the world with the genomic sequence, but that's a different thing. And, and in the absence of those samples, it actually makes the, the um, uh, development of, of um, an anti-vaccine a, a much more challenging thing to do. So China has been extremely uncooperative um, and they've really used Australia, I think, as a bit of a whipping boy to uh, you know, show that dissatisfaction to, to the world. Now, now, China would claim that actually they've been pretty transparent. The WHO has backed them up. Um, every step of the every step of the crisis, uh, and the WHO and China have also agreed to uh, an inquiry into the, how the WHO uh, reacted to the coronavirus pandemic. So China is basically saying, I saw a, a Global Times article, which is run by the the Chinese Communist Party, essentially saying that Australia has been embarrassed, that China has been able to actually say, well, we've got this investigation now. Um, so what would you what would you say to those point, points that actually? There is going to be an independent investigation into this, um, and that uh, China has been pretty transparent throughout the whole pandemic. Well, I think if anyone believes that China has been transparent, I've, I've got a really big grey harbour bridge in Sydney that I could I could sell to them. I mean, it's it's self evidently not the case, and you know another point of sensitivity, not just for China but but for the World Health Organization, has been the very unhealthy. Uh, relationships that have existed between the two. As I understand it, uh, Tedros was the, the poster boy for China when uh, there was a campaign to take over the leadership of the World Health Organization. Some of his comments, including uh, one quite recently that it was acceptable to reopen wet markets, I, th I think are just astounding uh, in terms of what it is that we expect the, the WHO to, to do. Um, and that, that's an issue that has to be um, addressed. I, I, I think um, how China has suborned a number of um, international organisations is really a bit of a hidden story that people don't know or, or talk much about, but will probably now be exposed as a, as a result of this. So I think, um, you know, at the World Health Assembly, which was held uh, last weekend, it, it, it obviously became, um, it became obvious to China that they were not going to be able to stop a sort of a global momentum to support um, uh, an EU uh, resolution uh, calling for this independent investigation. And I think China probably concluded that the best thing to do was just to allow that to happen. They didn't want to be embarrassed on the, the, the virtual floor of the meeting. Um, but uh, you can be pretty assured that um, they are not going to make this investigation easy. Um, and I think it's going to take a lot of attention from Australia and other countries to force the WHO to do this um, in as open and transparent a way as we would like. I, I still don't think that we should rule out um, the possibility, Stephen, that if, if the WHO won't do this properly, that we, the decent democracies, the UK and Australia and the other democracies, should actually have our own investigation. Um, pooling our intelligence resources and trying to piece together as best we can, seeing as we won't be allowed to go to Wuhan, uh, what, what that story is. I, I think we could get quite a long way, actually, in, in getting to a deeper understanding. But at the moment, at least, um, it looks like China has had a bit of a diplomatic defeat. Uh, that's why I think you get a sense of the annoyance and if you look at the Global Times about how they're trying to spin that into a, a problem for Australia. 
Um, and uh, now we move on to the next step stage of the story, which is, okay, so how is this investigation going to happen? And will it have any credibility? Well, that's the, that's the next question I was going to ask, actually, because it's difficult to, I mean, I've done a lot of research on, on what's going on. It's quite difficult to understand exactly what this investigation is going to look into that China has agreed to in the WHO. So can, do we know what it's going to look at? Is it going to look at the origins of the virus? Is it going to go into Wuhan? Do we know any of these things yet? No, and in fact, the um, you know one slight problem with the, the EU resolution was that in order to get it to a point that most countries could support, um, it is very vague as to what it is it's actually asking for. It doesn't even mention China by name. So in theory, this could be looking at Canada for all we know, but um, it, it, it'll be up to us. It'll be up to the, the member countries of the WHO to um, push for something that will look credible and realistic. Ideally, um, you know, what one would want would be for a sort of an international team of investigators to go to Wuhan. I would like to see them get into the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Uh, they should be looking at the wet markets. Um, there's a lot of people that they should be talking to about the handling of the disease and the Communist Party's engagement with that early on. Uh, you know, my sense is uh, we just need to press hard to see how much of that we can get. But at the end of the day, I wouldn't expect uh, that the party is going to be particularly helpful because they've got more to hide than they have to um, to help, uh, frankly, in terms of where this investigation will go. Now, you recently wrote uh, on your website at the, at the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, um, quote, I will be happy to accept Richardson's mantle of being a national security cowboy. Right now, Australia needs more cowboy and less kowtow, more principle and less of the pragmatism that has brought us to this sorry point. Um, can you expand on that? Can you explain how you're a bit of a cowboy? <laughs> well, um, it's, it's never really a title that I've aspired to, but there has been um, a bit of a um, domestic debate, I suppose, which would be perhaps best be described as the, the pragmatists on the one hand versus a, a sort of a national security hawks uh, on, the, on the other hand. Richardson is, uh, Dennis Richardson, former Secretary of Defence, sort of an exemplar of the pragmatists who've said that what we need to do is find ways to manage a relationship with China uh, that protect Australia's interests. Um, I, I think that has been, you know, um, a strategy that sort of worked in the 90s and worked in the early years of, of the new century, but it was always based on a bet. Uh, and the bet was that as we traded more with China, um, got closer to China, that China would become more like us. You know, it, it might necessarily ever turn into a democracy, but it would be more open and more tolerant and there'd be more of a free press. Um, in other words, a China that looks perhaps a little bit like Singapore. Um, now, that just didn't happen. Um, I, I think the possibility of China opening up to become like that was, was really killed off at about the time the students were run down by the tanks in Tiananmen Square now, now 30 years ago. That, that was a, a moment when China did have an opportunity to decide to open up but it's, instead it took the, the pathway to become more, more repressive. And that has only been turbocharged under Xi Jinping's arrival as, uh, as a president in, uh, in 2012. So my, my line on this has been to say that it's high time, well past time, in fact, that Australia has to give up on this fiction that we are going to be dealing with a country that's sort of democratising. And we have to understand um, China for what it is, which is a Leninist one-party state with a very strong um, concept of they win, we lose as being the model of how they want to approach diplomacy, uh, not, not just to Australia, but around the world, to the, to the UK and everyone else. Um, and for my sins, apparently I'm, I'm now a cowboy. Um, and, uh, you know, my thought about that was, as, as you read out, I think Australian uh, national security policy and foreign policy needs a bit more cowboy to it. It needs to actually have a bit more spirited willingness to stand up and defend our security interests. Um, and less of this idea that weasel words and sophistication can somehow make us walk this pathway so we can get rich by trading with China, but not worry about the downsides of their military policies, their human rights violations. 
their cyber spying um, on Australia. Um, and so what that what you were reading there is kind of an insight into a policy debate that I think has been running in Canberra for some years. But at this point, the, the Cowboys are winning, uh, Stephen, I think, uh, and the, the virus has really shown that to be the right judgment as to um, uh, the, the nature of the place that we're dealing with and then what follows in terms of how we have to respond. Now, you touched a bit on it there, but there's, I want to talk about Australian history, uh, or at least recent history of your relationship with China. Um, now, during the 1990s uh, and the early 2000s, you were sort of working within the government, advising, uh, advising the prime minister, advising the government on, on sort of what Australia's defence policy should be. Has the Chinese-Australian relationship been worse ever since, I mean, it must be, is this the worst point it's ever been in history? Um, and can you talk a little bit more about how China and Australia have interacted in the past and what kind of um, policies Australia has been an enacted in the past uh, to do with China? Well, maybe I'll, I'll deal with the second part of that first, because that will give some historical context to uh, have there been worse periods. Um, so Australia was quite quick to recognise uh, communist China as being uh, the legitimate uh, China. Uh, and um, at about the same time as Richard Nixon uh, visited Beijing to meet Mao, so did our then Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, do the same thing. So we've now had the better part of 50 years of a, of a relationship with China. Um, the, the big change for Australia was the decision that uh, Deng Xiaoping took in uh, the mid-1980s to open the economy up. And uh, frankly, Australia has had almost 30 years of you know, uninterrupted positive economic growth as a result of being able to trade with China to be the supplier of iron ore and coal for the massive growth of um, Chinese industrialism. Um, and we've also, by virtue of our geography uh, over that period, taken a significant number of people who've moved to Australia from China, often initially to study at Australian universities, but ultimately to become Australian citizens. So there's a strong people to people connection as well. All, all of what I've described um, has really been good. Uh, I mean, it's funded, for example, the defence budget that I've been a very strong advocate for. Uh, but but increasingly, we have found that as China has become powerful, it's it's also become uh, a, a much more assertive place. So the relationship that Australia has, when John Howard was Prime Minister and I was working for Howard 20 odd years ago, Howard had a very simple and, and successful policy to China, which was to say, let's let's just focus on the positives, the things that we have in common. We'll put to one side the issues that we have differences on human rights was a, was a big one. Um, and China was happy enough to sort of buy into that, um, into that line. Um, but as we move into, you know, the last 10 or 15 years, we, we're now dealing with, you know, uh, the world's second most powerful superpower, a country that has got a very significant military um, and a very assertive um, as, I, as I called it, a sort of they win, you lose approach to uh, de dealing with uh, foreign policy. And so those ideas of let's just focus on the positives, I think, have, have not, are just not, are just not possible anymore. Um, but the challenge is, is that in the 25 years or so of building that economic relationship, we've made ourselves so intertwined with uh, particularly the business part of uh, the Chinese connection that now we have to think about how do we unpick that um, if we're going to protect our national security interests. Um, on, on the point of um, have things ever been worse, uh, look, th there are sort of troughs and peaks in, in the China relationship, and uh, it's often the case that the Communist Party can turn on a dime uh, to change rhetoric. So. The experience we're seeing at the moment is what's being called by people's uh, wolf warrior diplomacy, which is a sort of uh, a take on a Chinese Rambo-like film. Uh, you know, you could easily see the party one day just deciding, gosh, that's not working so well for us. We'll go back to being sort of, you know, nice and, nice and cuddly. Um, it won't necessarily change the underlying strategic realities. So I, I think right now China is... Um, uh, the current state of relations is as bad as I've seen them in, in 30 years of working in, in Canberra uh, on these types of policy issues. 
Uh, and what's more, I don't think we can really reverse that. This, this is not something that a foreign minister's visit or a prime minister's visit will really change. And that's because we're on two different courses and increasingly clearly what China judges to be its key strategic interests are, are the opposite of what we see to be our strategic interests. So I, I, um, I'm forecasting that there's going to be, you know, an increasing period of um, of difficulty with really hard decisions that the Australian government will will have to take. We'll, we'll, we'll talk about the solutions in a minute to to, to Chinese uh, aggression, to the Chinese wolf warrior uh, uh, sort of tactics. But first of all, I just want to, I really want to get into what China's been doing in Australia in the in what, and as you say, the last decade that may be more uh, covert actions than what we see now. I mean, it's pretty obvious now with their their really hard rhetoric against Australia because Australia. Um, as we mentioned earlier, Australia is being quite um, vocal about criticising China, or not even criticising China, but, but asking for an independent inquiry. Um, there, there are a few things that China have been doing, not only in Australia, but in the West, in, in the West generally, sort of in America and Britain. Um, and, and they include intellectual property theft, sending Chinese spies into those countries, sending Chinese students into those universities to steal research. Can you talk a little bit about the other things, the more covert things that China has been doing in Australia and in the West in the last decade or two? Absolutely. Um, well, I mean, what your your summary is is pretty much right, and um, I, I would say that um, uh, inside our intelligence community, uh, the view would be not that they would um, say this, of course, but the view would be that China is probably responsible for seventy or eighty percent of the espionage uh, activity that is taking place in, in Australia right now. Um, the rest of it being the usual suspects, the Russians are pretty active as they always have been and um, one or two others besides. But China has been very active uh, in terms of cyber, uh, intellectual property theft. Um, for example, we had um, a federal election in Australia about uh, 12 months ago. And uh, we, we know that there was a really intense and sophisticated Chinese effort to hack into the political parties, uh, into the parliament and into a number of key institutions of the federal government. Um, very sophisticated, but very focused on finding out the, the, the leadership intent of both the then government and, and opposition. Um, <clears throat> there's There's been a constant um, Chinese interest in Australian business, be that finding out uh, the major um, iron and coal exporters um, in a thinking on pricing through to defence technology of which we have, um, you know, a surprising amount of homegrown uh, uh, defence technology know-how that China is very interested in. So uh, full on cyber spying and of course the, 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 uh, all of this goes on at exactly the same time as Chinese diplomats would be talking about what a trusted relationship that the two countries have. Um, then I think people tend to underestimate um, the extent to which human intelligence remains uh, a big part of the picture as, as well. And I think a large part of the Chinese effort there has been focused on our universities and research institutions. And the truth of the matter is our universities have done a pretty bad job of due diligence when it comes to working out who they could recruit on faculty, not really thinking about um, the security aspects of, of, those, um, of those positions. But that too has been a, a major, major source of uh, Chinese um, hacking. So here in Canberra, to give you an example, we have the Australian National University, which I studied at some, some years ago. Uh, about 18 months ago, it was revealed that the entire computer network system of the ANU had been compromised by China. And, you know, what they're looking for is based, a couple of things, really. They're looking for basic research. So our um, ANU is very good on a lot of the hard sciences and medical sciences. Um, they're also looking to get into the chat rooms of Chinese students um, studying in Australia because they're keen to police you know, the political thinking of, uh, of those um, students. So there's a major Chinese intelligence effort around dealing with the diaspora um, and with people, Chinese people who may be here temporarily to make sure that they stay like sort of loyal to, to party thought. Um, then um, the, the other thing I mentioned to you before um, handing back is, uh, you know, there's, there's also been 
not so much espionage, but what in China is known as United Front work. Um, yeah, the United Front is a department of the Chinese Communist Party, which is really there to try to sell internationally the story of China's success. And they will fund organisations here in, in Australia. Uh, and those organisations themselves can become front organisations that are making donations to our political parties uh, that are seeking to um, get people into uh, council levels of government, state levels of government, uh, to stack the branches of political parties. Uh, and this became, um, I think about four or five years ago, a major, major issue. I, I, I think our, our um, key political parties were really embarrassed to have exposed the extent to which they were subject to Chinese um, financing. And uh, that led our government to introduce, to sort of modernize our suite of anti-espionage laws and to bring in uh, what's known as the Foreign Influence Transparency Scheme, which is about uh, essentially compelling people to register themselves if they're engaged in lobbying activities on behalf of uh, governments. Now, you might say, well, that's not going to stop spies from spying. Uh, it, absolutely, it isn't, but it is going to give us a legal basis to prosecute them if we catch them. And uh, so, you know, our, our government, um, I think, moved quite effectively to modernise our espionage laws. But that hasn't stopped China from still being very active in terms of uh, doing that. And um, uh, it's possibly driven them a little more underground in, in, in their ways of operation. But they're still very active on the cyber front and the human intelligence front. Now, you just listed off a, a series of, of, of aggressive actions from the Chinese against the Australians. And I think that the Chinese are, are doing this in a lot of Western countries, not just in Australia. Um, and you could probably, I mean, li listening to that, to, to your monologue there, you could probably say, well, actually, this sounds a bit like a new 21st century Cold War. Do you believe that that's going on at the moment? There's definitely aspects of it um, and, and differences also. Uh, so, for example, at the height of the Cold War in the 60s and 70s, you know, there was never the degree of dependence between the West and the Soviet Union as, as, as we now have with many, many Western countries and China. So it's a very curious mix of interdependence and um, uh, quite savage competition at the same time. I think if you look at, at different sectors, um, you will find, uh, for example, in space, in undersea warfare, in cyber security, uh, and in human uh, espionage, uh, that they are areas where we basically have a full on, no holds barred um, Cold War. Um, and that's not going to get any, any better or, or any easier. Um, and then you can kind of like cross the street to where the finance departments are and the business community is, and you have something altogether different, which is about interdependence and, um, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, dipping into the wealth or trying to extract the wealth that is uh, modern China. Uh, and, you know, probably Australia is the poster boy for, <laughs> for both of those, uh, those dimensions um, and the challenge in front of all of us. But I would say also the UK, just as much as here, is, is how do we now unpick those, those different strands? Um, if China remains the way it is, um, I, I think we're going to all have to have more distanced relationships with the Communist Party, much more careful relationships over technology and cyber security and critical infrastructure. Um, doesn't mean to say that we can't trade with them, but, it, but this idea of, of trusted, deeply enmeshed relationships, I think, has probably gone forever as a result of the virus. I suspect that most people watching this, or at least most people just generally, in, I think in Britain, I can't speak for Australia, um, doesn't know really what's been going on in the last couple of decades to do with China's relationship with the West, doesn't know about, people generally don't know about what China, the kind of aggressive actions China have been taking covertly, and they generally view China, or that they're pretty apolitical towards China. Um, you know, they may view it, may, maybe some people view it as a threat, um, but until recently, most opinion polls showed that people were pretty apathetic towards China, at least in the UK. And this pandemic has really exposed China, or at least some of the problems that China, the Chinese Communist Party has, um, to the open. And, and the opinion, opinion polls in Britain are really swinging um, against China in terms of public opinion. Um, why do you think that people, I mean, this is just my view, but why do you think that people generally... Um, are pretty apolitical towards China or at least don't know about what China's been up to 
over the last, let's say, 10 years. And for example, in the UK, we had a government just five years ago, uh, George Osborne and, and David Cameron were in power. They were talking about the golden era of British Chinese relations. And, and that was basically what Britain's China policy was. And now we've got Boris Johnson as prime minister. He doesn't really have a Chinese policy. I mean, he's, he's accepted Huawei, a Chinese company, to invest in our 5G infrastructure. And if we had public opinion that said, actually, that, that might be a threat or that might be a danger to us, we shouldn't, be, um, we shouldn't be interacting with China in that way, then perhaps Boris Johnson would be a bit dissuaded from, from doing that policy, for example. So if we do have this Cold War, it's a pretty unknown one. Yes, well, look, I think, uh, you know, there's a very big difference between your strategic geography and ours. Um, and also, ch frankly, China just doesn't bloom as large in sort of daily UK life, it seems to me. Um, most Australians um, have had some experience of dealing with China, um, people to people connections. Uh, and overwhelmingly, it's been pretty positive, frankly. Um, if your experience is you're just dealing with normal Chinese people, uh, if you're dealing with the um, the Communist Party and the state intelligence apparatus and the military, it's a, it's a somewhat different story. Um, and it's it's certainly true to say that in Australia right now, trust levels are as low as I've ever seen them if you poll people on dealing with China. In the UK, um, you know, you're a lot further away. Uh, the Russia is perhaps bigger in terms of the British imagination around strategic threats. Uh, but I think that, that there has also been, um, if you can allow an Australian to say this, Stephen, a bit of British naivety about uh, dealing with China. So the golden century was truly an appalling period of uh, British foreign policy thinking. Um, but, you know, no, no different really from how a number of premiers of our states and territories uh, you can just see the dollar signs rolling in their eyes when they think about all of the things that could flow from a trade relationship with China. And that's what I think the, the UK was interested in. Uh, I mean, the interesting thing is when you get into 5G and critical infrastructure, I mean, there's now a really fascinating issue in the UK about uh, China uh, buying into your nuclear power facilities. Uh, then you have to start thinking about the strategic impact uh, because cyber security of critical infrastructure or, or the um, vulnerability of your businesses and, and government departments to Chinese spying is, is just as great in the UK as it is in a country like Australia that's much closer to, to the mainland. Um, and I would, I would hope um, that, you know, the, the virus has come as a pretty horrible wake up call, including for your prime minister, that China is not a country that you can deal with like it's France or Germany or, um, you know, even the US, even the US under Donald Trump, there, there are really significant differences to dealing with a hard Leninist regime, which is what we have with uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, and I, I suspect what will happen globally is that, um, the, the, you know, there's going to be a really backward, um, China is going to suffer, suffer a major backward step uh, in terms of its engagement with a whole bunch of countries. Uh, you can see that in Germany, you can see it in France and the EU. Uh, they've all come close, but I think that frankly, that they will be able to walk away from this not having been as compromised as we have been in Australia across so many sectors of our society. I want to talk about the, the, the global reaction to um, the pandemic, to China's, um, to China's sort of mishandling of the pandemic. I think that there's a lot of views in the West, that actually, and especially from people like Donald Trump and Scott Morrison saying, well, actually, China um, were, was not transparent. China, um, they shut down voices originally who were talking about there being a new pandemic. Uh, and they, they actually allowed five million people in early January to, to leave Wuhan. Um, and to go across the world. So there are various things that I think you know, people are pointing to and saying, actually, well, China has made all of these mistakes. And Donald Trump is a great example of this, who for years, since, ever since he's been elected, um, he's talked about this, the strategic threat that China poses against the West. And he's actually imposed various tariffs and trade wars against China. And now this is the issue that I really want to hone in on. And then let's talk about some other things the West may be able to do to sort of react to China. But this issue about exports. Now, Australia is an export-led economy, unlike Britain, for example. Um, so you've got a bit of a different dynamic to how you interact with China because they can basically impose tariffs on you and, and it will cause a huge, as you've seen with Bali, it can cause a huge impact 
on your economy. Donald Trump, as I said, has been imposing tariffs uh, on China for a few years now, talking, but he was talking about intellectual property theft and things like that as the reasons for, for, for putting those tariffs on. So can you talk a bit about how the West should react to China and how we can, perhaps there are people talking about um, making supply chains more um, more nationalistic, more less less dependent on China, and also um, just generally c- creating a sort of Western trading block or, or trading zone that can avoid China because of strategic um, threats that the communist regime poses. Yeah, uh, look, there's there's lots of uh, issues to sort of unpack in that. Um, I mean, I, I think the number one challenge for Australia right now is that we have to find ways of diversifying our, our trading relationships and um, to the extent that we can, um, reducing this um, overwhelming level of dependence that's been created on China uh, because the trading has been easy, um, the, the, the costs have been cheap, uh, and therefore businesses have just frankly not looked elsewhere um, and don't want to look elsewhere. I mean, there's there's a very strong business lobby right now, which is basically saying we just need to snap back to the old ways. And frankly, I don't think that's believable anymore. Um, So Australia is going to have to work very hard to diversify. Um, The good news is, um, you know, for for our biggest exports to China, which is um, iron ore, coke and coal for manufacturing processes, uh, and uh, gas. Um, China is as dependent on us as, as we are on them. Uh, so there is uh, sort of loose talk about our oh, China could switch to Brazil, but frankly, would you switch your supplies of those products of, uh, to Brazil at the moment? Um, I don't think too many countries would, and it would come with significant transition costs. Um, the areas where we're vulnerable, I think, is probably in tourism and education, where we have a huge, China is now our largest tourist market, um, uh, the largest foreign student body comes from China. But hey, no one's travelling anywhere right now and, and may not be able to for at least a year, if not longer. So that is probably going to see a number of Australian universities just go to the wall. Um, and uh, again, the smart thing for our, our universities and our tourist sector to do is to prepare to be um, open to much broader markets. Um, then what I'd say is, I, I think you're absolutely right that, um, that, again, the developed democracies, the decent democracies need to be thinking about this as a group, not, not just um, as individual countries to work out how can we um, uh, develop supply chains uh, that work for us collectively, but don't require Australia, for example, to develop its own uh, long range um, anti-aircraft missile industry, because that's going to be really prohibitively expensive for us. But if we could do that in combination with you and the Americans, you know, there's a hope that we could sort of manage that thing together. So I think this is going to drive the democracies more closely together. Um, and that's a great thing. Um, and it also means that we don't have to think of ourselves as sort of democratic versions of North Korea having to do everything inside uh, because we can develop trusted relationships. But that has to be on a platform of, I think, shared values and largely um, a some degree of shared strategic interests. The United States uh currently the world's biggest superpower or major superpower. It's, we, we sort of haven't mentioned it much uh, during this interview, but it's a really important factor in uh, Chinese and, and, as you say, developed um, democracy sort of relations. Uh, there's an election coming up in, in 2020 or this year in, in November between Joe Biden, uh, likely Joe Biden and Donald Trump. How much impact do you think that election will have on Western relations with China? Are you worried about either uh, presidential candidate coming in in terms of their foreign policy towards China? Not really. Um, you know, one of the few things that actually brings Democrats and Republicans together in Washington right now is a shared view of China. And um, I think Trump is going to try to campaign uh, on the line that Biden is soft on China, but um, I don't think that's that's really the case. Um, I, I think that whoever is elected after the um, presidential election uh, there is going to continue to be a really difficult relationship between uh, China and the United States because the structural problems won't go away. Um, and, you know, they will have to be dealt with by who, whoever is in the White House. Uh, frankly, 
Trump has made things difficult for us, though, because, you know, we look to the United States to provide sort of coherent leadership across all manner of things. Uh, and that's really not been forthcoming with, with Trump. Um, so I think if Biden were elected, we'd probably get something that we were a bit more used to in terms of the style of how American presidents operate and the type of language that they use. But there'd probably be less difference on the content than either of them would really <laughs> want to admit. And um, uh, in both cases also, I think, uh, and this is important for allies of the United States as, as both our countries are, whoever is in the White House, they, they are going to have higher expectations of what their allies deliver. Um, you know, Trump is really um, a, a sort of a, an outcome of uh, too many Americans feeling uh, pissed off, if I can use the phrase, that the rest of the world was riding on their security coattails and that wasn't doing enough to look after their own security interests. And after, you know, a decade and a half of pretty unsuccessful wars in the Middle East, the Americans have had enough of that. So the, the message to us and to NATO very, very loud and clear has been you have to do more. Uh, and I'm, I'm very comfortable with that. I think that's what self-respecting countries should do. And uh, Biden might say it in slightly nicer language, but it'll be pretty much the same message if he's the president after November. Let's talk a bit about Taiwan, uh, which is another major issue that's been bubbling away for over 70 years now um, of, of tension between China and every country around the world. Um, New Zealand has said that Taiwan should join the uh, World Health Organization or at least have a seat at the table. Um, various countries are now calling for the same thing to happen. China obviously um, are very angry about this and, and not happy at all. Uh, where do you see the tensions um, between China and various other countries to do with Taiwan leading to? Could there be, in, you know, in the medium term, in the long term, a military um, kind of escalation? Do you expect that to happen? And we've seen a, we've seen a build up, a build up sorry, of um, Chinese military in the South China Sea. Can you also talk a bit about that and where you see that heading in the medium and long term? Sure. So, um, uh, uh Beijing has, over the last five or six years, gotten tougher and tougher on uh, dealing with Taiwan, essentially trying to lay down the law to other countries what the One China policy means, setting tighter and tighter restrictions on engagement with Taiwan. And I think the main reason they're doing this is because um, if, you're, if you're a senior person in the Chinese Communist Party, what, what Taiwan demonstrates is something that you don't want Chinese people to know about, which is that Chinese people can be very successful liberal Democrats. Um, I mean, uh, you know, I've been to Taiwan. It is it is a very pleasant, stable liberal democracy with a, a vigorous free press, an independent judiciary, peaceful elections as they've had now for, for 20 odd years. It is the model of a democratic society uh, with Chinese characteristics, Chinese cultural characteristics. And it sort of gives lie to the thought that you have to have the Communist Party in charge of a big nation like uh, uh, China. Uh, and I think that's behind a lot of the uh, Xi Jinping view that Taiwan really needs to be brought back into the control of the mainland, much as he's trying to do with Hong Kong on, a, on an accelerated schedule in, as far as Hong Kong is concerned. Um, the, other, the other thing that Taiwan enables um, uh, Xi Jinping to do is to create a sort of a nationalist rally around the flag effect for the Chinese population. Uh, and so my, my theory is that the party really did a dreadful job of managing the virus. Um, it's completely tanked in terms of the economic aspirations for growth um, over the next few years. So there's a lot of Chinese people who are pretty annoyed with the party now. Um, what do you do? Well, you wag the dog, uh, you, you sort of turn attention to a, an international issue, which is, as, as the communists call it, the reunification of, of Taiwan, even though Taiwan has never been under communist control. Um, and um, I, I must say, this is a, uh, an issue that Chinese people do seem to have very passionate nationalistic views about. The party sort of stokes them, but they are very definitely there in the minds of your, your normal Chinese person. And um, I, I think that's a risk. Um, I, I really do think that as we move into 2021, that's, that is a big security risk. 
not necessarily that there would be a full-on Chinese invasion, but that what you could have is a is a circumstance where uh, China blockades Taiwan, stops ships from sailing in the Straits of Taiwan, essentially tells the rest of the world go away, and they try and sort of stick their thumb on the carotid artery of, of Taiwan. Um, all for the purposes of getting the Chinese population to rally round the Communist Party internally. Um, now, I, I really just I, I worry about that. I worry about the ability of China to sort of control this without it actually spiralling off into major conventional conflict. And I worry about the people of Taiwan because as I look at them, you know, what I see is a a liberal democracy, as I've said, of 25 million people, a little bit like the Australian liberal democracy of 25 million people. So if the world writes off Taiwan as not being important enough to do anything about, does that mean they're going to write off Australia as well? Uh, I think we all have an interest in sort of rallying around Taiwan and its, its uh, situation at the moment. But um, you're absolutely right to say that right now, even as we speak, there is a heightened level of Chinese military activity taking place in the, what we call the first island chain, which is all of the islands surrounding the Chinese mainland from, uh, from uh, Japan down to Taiwan, the Philippines, and then into the South China Sea and, and Southeast Asia. Uh, we've got Chinese ships uh, and uh, aircraft aggressively pushing up against the ships and aircraft of all of those countries, um, effectively asserting Chinese control. And um, that's that's pretty risky, uh, Stephen. Um, I mean, about two weeks ago now, there was an incident near the Philippines where a Chinese warship actually illuminated its weapons targeting radar onto a Philippines ship. Uh, in, in a military sense, um, that is a tantamount to staging an attack on a, on a ship. Uh, and when you're in that kind of situation, you really are in flashpoint territory where, you know, um, a, an exchange could happen very quickly and the ship or aircraft is, uh, is destroyed. Um, that doesn't necessarily then mean the Third World War is it's on its way, but it certainly would plunge the region into a very, very tense uh, situation. And I'm now talking about, you know, days and months, not, uh, not something that's a possibility in five or ten years' time. You talked a little bit about um, the reason for China maybe taking more aggressive action would be to rile or to rally up um, their internal population. Do you think that the pandemic, the COVID-19 pandemic, has shown that, that there is a bit more dissent within China, there's a bit more anger within China, within the Chinese population against the Chinese Communist Party? And I'll give you one example of this. Um, Dr. Li Wenlang, a Chinese doctor in Wuhan last year, texted his colleagues in late December or told his colleagues uh, to be careful because there's a new pandemic, there's a new virus um, in Wuhan. He was shut down by the Chinese Communist Party. He was told to sign a confession that he'd been spreading false and dangerous rumours. And for a couple of days on, on, on Chinese social media, there was a huge uproar uh, within China uh, about um, what, what the Chinese government did to, to Dr. Li. And obviously, um, a month later, Dr. Li tragically died from coronavirus. So are we seeing the beginnings uh, of internal dissent within China? And, and do you think that the Chinese people's views of the regime are changing and are adapting? Well, you know, there has always been uh, internal dissent to some degree. Uh, it, it's just that under Xi Jinping, the instruments of repression have become much more widespread and, and much more sophisticated. And indeed, um, Xi Jinping has, you know, spent a, a very large part of um, the last few years essentially uh, destroying factional opponents uh, of, of him inside the party and inside the, the military. Um, so um, uh, it's definitely the case that dissent, if, you, if you're going to be a dissenter in China, you're going to pay a very high personal price right now. Uh, and I think that is having the effect of um, sort of pushing the this popular discontent, discontent down, but it very definitely is there. Um, I mean, you know, the Chinese are intelligent, sophisticated people. Uh, I don't think they like being repressed any more than we would. And there are some very brave people there who, notwithstanding the consequences, are prepared to talk out and, and to say things. What, what was interesting about the uh, coronavirus experience was that um, mostly that dissent 
find, finds a, a channel of expression through complaining about corruption at local levels, very, very sort of local party type issues. What the virus did was um, create a focus of unhappiness about the party central's management of this in Beijing. In other words, the very top leadership in, in Beijing. And that's unusual. That that was, I think, for the first time that I can really recall, maybe since Tiananmen Square, a, a moment when there was the potential for a broad critique of the party to take hold amongst Chinese people. Um, and I think it's why we're seeing the party look so rattled at the moment with this um, aggressive diplomacy internationally. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, they are because they are worried about losing their control. They're worried about losing their grip on the sort of popular sentiment of the party. Now, um, I wouldn't want to suggest that this is going to change China's political system overnight because the instruments of repression are too strong. Uh, but I think there's definitely a hint that, um, that, that we've seen some very serious strategic mistakes by Xi Jinping and he knows it. And that's why we're, they're now trying to cover that up by focusing overseas and getting louder and more, strident, and more strident. I want to ask one more question, uh, one last question. Uh, and I want, it's hard to know what China's aims are. And I've always, I always ask this in interviews talking about China, um, because I think most people in the West probably don't quite understand what the, what the Communist Party wants. Um, and they've got various schemes, uh, you call you know, Made in China 2025 is one of them. Um, and they've got various long-term plans. Uh, so can you explain to viewers what China's goals are, and crucially, is it inevitable that they will achieve them? Look, the, the, the party's number one goal in China is to stay in power. Uh, and frankly, that's what it wants to do above the interests of everything else, of the Chinese people, of China's global aspirations. That's what the party wants to do. Um, and I would say probably about 98% of Xi Jinping's time is, is focused on that objective. Um, and, you know, a major part of how the party can achieve that is to keep delivering uh, to the expectations of the Chinese people for enhanced standards of living. And, and it's often been said as a sort of a, a shorthand that if China can keep growth to about 6% of gross domestic product, that means that there is sufficient sort of enhancements to the standard of living of, of Chinese people that they will accept that and tolerate the idea of the party being in power. Um, so economic growth has been so party in power, number one, economic growth, number two. Number three, I think, has been um, uh, an aspiration to uh, sort of lift China onto the global stage as, as a major power probably the dominating power in the Pacific region, the Asia Pacific region, um, and that the rest of the world should uh, tremble and obey, if I can put it that way. There's, there's not really a sense in China of leading a community of states. It's more about China as the, as the middle kingdom. And it is the role of small countries to sort of pay uh, due respect to, to the position of China. And that has, you know, a very powerful uh, nationalistic resonance amongst ch ordinary Chinese people. It's not necessarily a Communist Party thing, it is just how China sees itself. And of course that is stoked by constant references to 200 years of humiliation, military occupations. Uh, there are times if you go to Beijing where you know, you'll see nothing on TV except for soap operas about the great patriotic war against the Japanese, for example, which is all about stoking contemporary nationalism. Um, but reaching its rightful place, the true China dream, as uh, Xi Jinping calls it, I think that's been another aspiration as well. Now, will they get there? Um, I think, um, you, you know, one of the mistakes we've made in Australia has, has really been to only think about China basically in the last 40 years from the time of uh, the economic opening uh, in the 80s with Deng. Uh, and therefore, if you talk to a lot of officials in Australia, that's all they've ever known. And they tend to think that's just going to continue on forever. And sooner or later, China will overtake the Americans as the world's biggest economy. And then, you know, onwards and upwards. My, my, um, my response to that has always been to say, you need to reframe how you think about China to look at a longer sweep of history. 
uh, if you go back to say 1878 as opposed to 1978, what you will actually see is a sweep of history where almost every generation uh, China has uh, usually at immense human cost fundamentally changed its political systems and reinvented itself to be something else. So we saw the end of the imperial system, brief period of nationalist rule, uh, then the communist takeover, uh, then the Cultural Revolution, uh, and then finally uh, Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms. So that's five sort of fundamental changes of how China has operated. And for four of those, tens of millions of people die. Um, and I, I think you get a sense of um, just how scared the party is to not be the victim of, you know, another fundamental political change. But I couldn't rule that out. I, I, I don't think that what's happening in, in China is now sustainable. And as I say, they are a sophisticated people with aspirations, I think, for a better lifestyle and a freer lifestyle. And, and sooner or later, I think this is going to lead to uh, a challenging of the party, which they may not be able to prevent. Thank you so much, Peter, for joining us. And can I just say, if people want to find out more about uh, these topics, they can go to the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Uh, they can look them up and uh, they can find out more about this fascinating discussion. Thank you, Stephen. It's been a pleasure talking to you and um, uh, good luck in the UK as you deal with your own uh, challenges at the moment. Thank you.